is man. Let's pray. Father, thank you for, again, a, a great Lord's Day. I've truly enjoyed it and be blessed, been blessed. I hope others have as well. Most of all, Father, I pray that you've been rightly honored and glorified in what we've said and done. And as we come to this portion of this uh, service, Lord, it is our prayer that you would open your word to us. As we look at this psalm, maybe we'll be able to gain whatever uh, capacity we have, an un a greater understanding of this tr truth. As we bring other truth to bear with this psalm, uh, Father, I pray that the, what I see as an incredible message uh, might be something that all of us would walk away understanding fully and then just reveling in and praising you more fully for all that you are doing for us. As always, Lord, we confess our inadequacy. Without you, without your Spirit's help, nothing of value will happen here this afternoon. So we submit ourselves to you and to your Spirit's control, and we pray that he would use this time in our lives. May we do our part, Lord, if, uh, if we're fatigued, if we're tired, if having just eaten a meal is, is a struggle for us, Lord. May we fight through it. May we even feel comfortable to get up and stand if that's what's necessary, that we might give our attention to your word, not to my sermon, but to your word, and let you speak to us, Lord. We thank you. We praise you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. I think anybody, even just if, if you haven't thought about this psalm in a long time and you just followed along the verses as I read them here for us just a minute ago, you will realize that on the very surface, this is undoubtedly a psalm that is speaking with the issue of mankind. Yet isn't it interesting that even in a psalm that is, I'm confident, speaking really to man in his situation, the psalmist chooses to begin this psalm and end this psalm with a declaration of the greatness of God. Why would he do this? Why, when the psalm's, psalmist's intention was to bring attention to man... And what God is doing in man's life, why would he feel compelled, and it's a very short song, why would he start it and end it with basically the same words of praise to God? I think we all know the answer. I think there can only be one answer, and that is that God is everything. Even when we think about mankind and the blessings that we have in this life, without God, there's nothing. God is to be praised for all that he has created man to be, and all that he has redeemed man to accomplish. Everything must begin and everything must end with God. That's, this psalm is a great reminder of that. Every time we would sing it or every time we would read it, it's a great reinforcement of that. Everything begins with God. Everything ends with God, even when it comes down to my life and my experience. Now, David begins and ends this psalm with a declaration. Oh, Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth. In declaring the name of God, we don't see it in our English Bibles, but David actually uses two different Hebrew words that are translated Lord in our English Bibles. The first one is Yahweh, at least that's the way most of us have decided to, be, to pronounce it. We don't really know. It's, it has no vowels. It's just consonants. It's, it's a name that Israel wouldn't even speak. They wouldn't even write uh, because of their belief in the greatness of God. But this term, this title, if you will, of God seems to carry, at least in its essence, the idea of the eternality of God and the self-existence of God. The second word that's translated Lord here is Adonai, which carries the idea of God being our Lord or our Master. So if you put these together as David actually did, then he's saying, O Yahweh, Adonai, or God, the self-existent one, our Lord and Master, how excellent! And the idea behind that word excellent is how majestic how exalted, God, is your name in all the earth? And I think by making the statement in all the earth, David is acknowledging that Israel's God is the God of all the earth. He is the God of all creation. Thus, God's name, Israel's God's name, is worthy of all the world's adoration. Why is it? You know, I think, again, we know the answers. I'm just throwing these out here for a sermon's sake. But why is it that Judeo-Christianity is so hated throughout the world. Why is it? I think there's probably many reasons why it is, but I think one of those reasons comes down the line of what David actually says here, and that is the fact that both true Judaism and true Christianity acknowledges that there is only one God. Only one. Our God is not just one of many gods, 
competing for man's worship or man's allegiance. No, our God is the one true God. He is the creator of all things. He is the ruler of all things. He is the only one worthy of everyone's praise. He's the one, if you were with us last Sunday afternoon as we looked at Psalm 2, is the one whose name will be praised one day. Every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Why? Because it has to be that way. There is nobody else that can be praised, worshipped, or honored. There is only one God. And that's what David acknowledged. May all the earth praise his name. But David goes on and he says, This God who has set your glory, have set your glory above the heavens. The word glory, or translated glory here is a Hebrew word. It's not the typical Kabod, I, I think is the way you say it, is the word we often see in the Old Testament that is behind the word, our English word glory. But this is the word hod, and it carries the idea of majesty or splendor. So David is saying that God has set his majesty, God's majesty or splendor, above the heavens. I think in other words, he's maybe saying this, God far exceeds the glory of this created universe. And I think David feels compelled to say this because we're going to see in a moment that this psalm is going to reflect upon the majesty of some of the things that God has created. But before David spends any time drawing his readers or his singers' attention to all the glorious things that God has created, he wants to assure that his readers understand the, how manifestly superior God is <laughs> even to the things that he has created. God's majesty exceeds all all of the glories of creation. And the reason why is because he's the creator of it all. Before continuing on his thought, which his thought seems to drop down to verse 3, at least in, in following a, a logical train of thought, David brings us verse 2, which almost seems out of place here. It's almost like David gets sidetracked for a minute. And he speaks to the fact that God has chosen to silence the foolishness of sinful men by the words, if you will, of young children or young babes. Verse 2, out of the mouth of babes and nursing infants, you have ordained strength because of your enemies, that you may silence the enemy and the avenger. Jesus didn't quote this whole section of Psalm 8, but he used a portion of this verse uh, at the time of his triumphal entry into Jerusalem. And you remember when he came in, the people are crying out, children, and others are crying out, what, Hosanna, glory to God in the highest, you know. And the religious leaders are saying, whoa, 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 turn no tip of those people down. What are they doing saying these things? And one of the answers Jesus had was, well, if they don't say it, the rocks are going to cry out. Somebody's got to say this. But he also referenced this portion of Psalm 2. He said, uh, when the chief priests and scribes saw the wonderful things that he did and the children crying out in the temple and saying, Hosanna, the son of David, they were indignant and said to him, Do you hear what these are saying? And Jesus said to them, Yes, have you never read out of the mouth of babes and nursing infants? You have perfected praise. Jesus' use of Psalm 8 had to sting because it made these religious leaders out to be the enemies of God that are found in David's psalm. Remember, that's what he said. You've used out of the mouth of babes and nursing interests, you've ordained strength. You are silencing your enemies through the words of these babies. So when Jesus quotes this portion of this psalm, which undoubtedly all these religious leaders knew the truth of what it said, he's basically saying, he's silencing you. <laughs> You're the enemy here. You're the only one that's saying these things shouldn't be said about me. So he is basically making them out to be the enemies of David's psalm. But I think even beyond that, I'm sure it further enraged them because by attributing the truth of this psalm to his own personal circumstance in Jerusalem, Jesus was de clearly declaring that he himself was God. Because <laughs> this psalm is talking about that, and these people had said, glory to God in the highest, Hosanna. Jesus is saying, this, I'm the fulfillment of this verse. I am God. <laughs> he wasn't backing away from his deity. He was actually exalting it at that time. So David throws that in for whatever reasons. Who knows what he was facing in his personal life. We know how God, Jesus chose to use it later in his own ministry. But then he comes back to verse 3, which appears to be the ongoing thought of his initial theme. And he says, When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have ordained. Let's just stop there a minute. I know his thought goes on, but 
probably all of us have been there, but think about David and his upbringing from what we know from the scriptures. How many nights, I'm sure, David spent lying on the ground, looking up at the sky. If you've always lived in an urban area, the, the sky can still be magnificent, but it's incredible when you're actually out in a dark, open place where there's no other artificial lights going on. And if it's a clear night, just the magnificence of the stars and the moon and all of the, the heavenly beings. And David had spent many a night out there, obviously, as a shepherd and a king who's been displaced and fleeing for his life. How many nights, you know, we read of his psalms where he says, I cried in my bed in the night watches. How many times did David lay out open to the stars and just look up into the sky and the thoughts, he's giving us insight into the thoughts that penetrated into his minds. He said, these are your heavens, O oh God. This is the handiwork of your fingers, God. As he looked at the moon, as he looked at the stars, he says, they're here, God, because you ordained them to be so. I often hear Christians, and I think it's a great thing to hear, often hear Christians making a statement, oh, what a beautiful sunset it was. Oh, those flowers, aren't they magnificent? Isn't it a beautiful creation? Isn't this wonderful? Aren't all of these things great? But I wonder sometimes if we don't find ourselves, if we're not careful, being more enthralled with the creation itself than we are with the one who created it. We see in David's words here that he doesn't get sidetracked by the beauty and the splendor of the moon and the stars. David was moved by the beauty of the moon and the stars then to do what? To proclaim the awesomeness of the one who created them. We as Christians can be guilty of sometimes reflecting only on the beauty and wonder of creation while failing to fully contemplate and praise the wonder of the creator who placed it all here. Creation is simply a reflection of God's power his beauty, his orderliness, his majesty. If we only find ourselves giving praise to creation, it's misunderstanding the purpose of creation itself. Creation exists to give glory to the God who created it. It only consists, we are told in the book of Colossians, it only continues to hold together because of the God who is holding it together by his power. So yes, this, this creation is awesome, and it ought to make us revel in it and wonder at it and praise over it, but don't get caught up praising creation. Praise the Creator. Too many false religions have found themselves where they're in awe of the creation, and it becomes their God rather than the God who made it. The Bible's pretty clear, folks. This incredible creation, as wonderful as it is, it's going to get eaten up in a moment. It's going to be consumed in a flame of fire. The eternal God lives on, and he's going to create another one, a new heavens and a new earth. And the wonder of it isn't going to be the creation itself. The wonder of it's going to be the creator. So David's thinking this way, and we, as we read this psalm or sing this psalm, ought to be thinking this as well. So as David understands this, he wants to praise God accordingly. But his meditation, as he's laying there under the stars, leads him to another startling declaration. And it really comes forth as a question in verse 4. This starts to get into the meat. I think of where we're going this, this afternoon. David asks this question, What is man that you are mindful of him, and the son of man that you visit him? Now, as David is meditating on this vast and beautiful creation, and really only one portion of it, apparently, this time he's looking at the stars and the moon that's up in the sky, and he's thinking in his own mind, what does this say about the creator, the one who's made all of this? The one whose majesty David has already declared is far above the heavens, as glorious as this is, he far exceeds. This is glorious far beyond it. David's overcome with a thought. This incredible God who has created all these things has been and continues to be, David says, mindful of men. God, David says, the God who made all of this. He's mindful of man. Beyond that, hear what he says. This God who has created all of these things, he has visited man. 
I think in context, we could perhaps understand David's thought in this way. God has created this vast and almost incomprehensible universe, yet his glory is far above it. As much as we get awed by what's here, David says he's far above it. He's, maybe we could say it this way, he's far apart from it. He's not dependent upon this creation as, glass, as glorious as it is. No, he's far apart from it. He exceeds it. He's way outside of it. That God created it is not a question. That God is sustaining it is not a question. A question. We won't take time tonight for most of us know the answers, but Genesis clearly informs us when and how God created these heavenly bodies. He does it on the fourth day of creation in the book of Genesis, and he does it simply by speaking them to existence. Yet I think in light of what David is, is thinking here, let me ask you this question. Have you ever contemplated this? And I don't know that we can know the answer other than just what we're supposing in our mind. Is God mindful of the moon? And is God mindful of the stars on a regular basis? Let me ask it this way. Has God ever, or does God now, visit the moon? Or visit the stars? Has he ever visited the moon? Or visited the stars? God, man has unless you're one of those conspiracy theorists that thinks it was all in a movie somewhere. Man has. Man's been on the moon. Has God ever been there? Yeah, well, of course, because God's everywhere. He's omnipresent. I get that. But has God personally ever been there? Has Jesus ever been on the moon? Has Jesus ever been on a star? Yet David informs us in this psalm, God is mindful of mankind. Beyond that, he says, God has visited. God himself, this creator, he has visited mankind. This thought that pops into David's mind as he's laying out there on the ground, looking up at the sky, then causes him to ask this question. What then is man. What is man that God himself would choose to think about him? What is man that God himself would choose to visit him? And please, ladies, don't be offended. I'm using man in the generalistic sense. I'm speaking to you women as well. Who are we that God thinks about us? Who are we that God visits us? David then goes on to establish a few more realities concerning man that he thinks is applicable to his thought process here. Verse 5, he says what? For you have made him, mankind. You've, God, you've made mankind a little lower than the angels. We've already talked a little bit about that term. Might just be the angels, and that's the way I'm going to probably approach it tonight, but it could be just a little lower than the gods. Gods in the pluralistic sense of the Godhead, if we think about it in the true God. And then he goes on and he says what? You have crowned him, you've crowned man with glory and honor. Verse 6, he goes on and says this. You have made man, you have made him to have dominion over the works of your hands. So, he, he, God has made mankind to have dominion over these incredible things that God himself has made, that David's been talking about here, all right? You, God, have put all, is what the Hebrew just says all, we are translations insert things there there's nothing wrong with that you have put God has put all things under his feet who's the his here man's feet God has put all things under man's feet verse 7 all sheep all oxen even the beasts of the field the birds of the air the fish of the sea that pass through the paths of the seas. I don't know if this is 
touching your heart like it did mine in my office. These are amazing statements. Amazing statements if we let them have their full worth. David informs us that God has made mankind a little lower than the angels. We really don't know a lot about the angelic realm. We don't. The Bible hasn't chosen to tell us a whole lot about them. We do know this. From the depiction we have in the scriptures, angels are pretty amazing created beings. Lucifer, we think of him now as the devil, the fallen angel, is an angel. And concerning his created wonder, the Bible states this, speaking of him, you were the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering, the sardius, the topaz, and diamond, beryl, onyx, and jasper, sapphire, turquoise, and emerald with gold. The workmanship of your timbrels and pipes, seemingly most people think that means he was musical, was prepared for you on the day you were created. You were the anointed cherub that covers. He was given the incredible position of actually overshadowing the very throne of God. I, God, have established you. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked back and forth in the midst of fiery stones. You were perfect in your ways from the day you were created till iniquity was found in you. That's just a description of one of the angels. One of the few descriptions of any of that type of thing that we have in the Bible. David says in his psalm, mankind was made a little lower than the angels. But if we say, well, that's what God said. I want to be as an angel, or I want to be better than an angel. I don't want to be a little lower than the angels. Well, maybe it's not so bad, because consider what David says in the end of verse 5. He says, and you have crowned him, God has crowned man with glory and honor. Those two terms, glory and honor, come up quite a bit in our Bibles, but almost always they're references to God. And this glory is kabod, that word that often does reference the glory of God. Yet here we learn that mankind, David says, was crowned by God with glory and with honor. In what way could that even be possible? To me, the only answer is because of the fact that the Bible informs us that man was created in the very image of God himself. As incredibly awesome as angels are, nowhere in the scriptures are they ever depicted as being created in God's own image. But mankind clearly has been. Male and female, he created them in his image. Therefore, mankind, David says, has been crowned with glory. Mankind, David says, has been crowned with honor. Then David says what God has chosen to do with mankind in verse 6. God has created man to have dominion over the works of God's hands. When we, like David, get overwhelmed with the incredible wonder of God's creation, do we ever go on to ponder the fact that all of the created beings of God, as of all of them, according to the scriptures, we alone were the only ones who were granted dominion over the rest of the works of God's hands? Just chew on that for a moment. And while I think angels are actually probably more, what word, I don't know, superior in their essence to humans, while this psalm doesn't speak to it, I think we would have to honestly ask the question, if God may not have even given us dominion over the angelic realm. Because it isn't it interesting that in the book of Hebrews, we are told that angels are what? They are ministering spirits to humans. And God has chosen to give them the job of ministering to us. 
Therefore, if God has placed man and given him the authority to have, be over, to have dominion over the works of God's hands, then perhaps that even means that we have authority over the angelic realm as, as well. Certainly, David at least is speaking to the realm of this created world in which we exist. Because he goes on and lists some specific things here that God has given us authority over, obviously. Verse 7, sheep and oxen, the beast of the field, the birds of the air, the fish of the sea that pass through the paths of the sea. I'm sure, I'm confident, that we don't fully understand all that this terminology means. And probably the reason that we don't fully understand what this terminology means is given the fact that we're living at this moment under the curse of Adam's sin. I'm going to read you something that's kind of thought-provoking and maybe gets your mind thinking this way if you're not already. Richard Phillips in his commentary on Hebrews, because we're going to Hebrews in just a moment, says this, At present, we do not yet see everything in subjection to him, speaking of man. Here is a statement of the problem of our race, the problem of dominion lost. What God intended for man in creation is not what we see at present. I think this is why we struggle so much with even these verses. Probably why this psalm isn't very much of a blessing to us because of the situation we're living in under the fall. Because he says this, what an understatement. As we look around, the Bible says, it certainly doesn't appear as if man has everything under control. If God placed everything under man's feet, then something has gone awry. If we begin making a list of those things in this world, very evidently not under man's control, it quickly becomes quite large. Man is at the mercy of weather. His food supply even today is greatly influenced by forces outside his control. Mankind is starving, bleeding, crying, and suffering all over the globe. Hurricanes, droughts, tornadoes, and floods beat against man with unmastered fury. Man may enjoy a large degree of influence over nature and the animal creation, but he does not rule them. Indeed, man is not able to control his own self, his own passions, or even his own thoughts. A quick look at the newspaper will display this in terms of international, civic, and individual crisis that abound on every side. At present, we do not yet see everything in subjection to him. That is the announcement of the problem that is extremely well backed up by the evidence. <laughs> How lamentably true is this fact? And because none of us, because we are all fallen sons of Adam, because none of us have ever known the dominion that's being spoken about here in the psalm, we don't even know what we're missing out on. We just think this is the way it's supposed to be. We think man was created to be at the mercy of the creation. No. No. Again, I say no. The Bible is adamant. Man is supposed to dominate the creation. Man is supposed to have authority over all the things God has made. Man is supposed to be in control of these things, but we're not. And this isn't the point of my message this evening either, but the thought's been rolling in my mind ever since I've been studying this. It's like, Adam and Eve, why are, what were you thinking? Lucifer, who has already left his first estate, this glorious estate of being the anointed cherub that covers, comes to Adam and Eve, especially Eve, and tempts her and says, oh, there's a better life than what God's given you here in this garden. What? God created these two people to rule creation. I don't even know what that means. I have to believe that had Eve looked at Lucifer and said, be gone, he would have had to have left because she had dominion over creation. I wonder if she had the power or Adam had the power to say, I want a tree there, be one. I want an animal there. Be there. I want the wind to blow this direction. Blow. Jesus did that, didn't he? Say, but he is God. I get it. But he was also man. I wonder if Jesus wasn't actually displaying for us 
the reality of what mankind was created to be. But Adam and Eve were so stupid. If I'd have been there, I'd been stupid too. But they fell for the lie. You're being deprived. I'm offering you something better. And the moment they ate in disobedience, they lost it all. And now they've been groveling at the mercy of all of this creation and all of its intensity that can be poured upon them, and they are powerless to do anything about it. As the writer in the, in the commentary said, they can't even control their own selves. We were laughing at the table about eating and overeating. We can't even control our own appetites. Yet I was created to control the universe. And I can't even control whether I get up on time. Yeah, we've improved our estate by rebelling against our creator. No, dear friends, what we did was lose everything that God intended us to have. It's his ultimate creation of beings made in his own image. Let's go to Hebrews 2. Let's put some perspective on it, though, because while this is so sad, and it should make us sad, Hebrews tells us there's great news coming. Hebrews chapter 2. Verse 5, for he has not put the world to come of which we speak in subjection to angels, but one testified in a certain place saying, I wonder who it was that testified this. <laughs> the writer of Hebrews, I think he probably knew, but even he didn't, he says, I've read this somewhere before. Where did he read? He read our psalm that we're studying tonight. Verse 6, what is man that you are mindful of him? Or the son of man that you take care of him? You have made him a little lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor and set him over the works of your hands. You have put all things in subjection under his feet. For in that he put all in subjection under him, he left nothing. Now I love Hebrews. If, if, if we say, well, maybe we're taking it a little bit too much when we read this into David's psalm. Well, the writer of Hebrews didn't feel uncomfortable doing that under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. He says, he hath put all all in subjection under him. He left nothing that is not put under him. But now we do not see yet all things put under him, but we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, might test de taste death for every one. For it was fitting for him for whom are all things, and by whom are all things, and bringing many sons to glory, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. For both he who sanctifies and those who are being sanctified are all of one, for which reason he is not ashamed to call them brethren, saying, I will declare your name to my brethren. In the midst of the assembly, I will sing praise to you. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, here am I and the children whom God has given me. And as much then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same, that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is the devil, and release those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. For indeed he does not give aid to angels, but he does give aid to the seed of Abraham. Therefore in all things he had to be made like his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make propitiation for the sins of the people, for in that he himself has suffered being tempted, he is able to aid those who are tempted. I don't know if you're like me. For many, many years when I read this section of Hebrews chapter 2, I assumed that the author had to be speaking of Jesus. Even though he's, as he was quoting Psalm 8, I did so because we know that the whole, auth, the whole book of Hebrews is showing the superiority of Jesus Christ. And so I just assumed these verses were speaking of Jesus, but I'm pretty convinced. I'm really convinced. I'm convinced. I don't know if I can convince you. I'm convinced that's not the case here. I think the writer of Hebrews is using David's psalm exactly the way that David intended it to be used. It is a declaration, I'm confident that the writer of Hebrews, of the wonder of God's creation of mankind. 
Yet what does the writer of Hebrews inform us? The reality we're all aware of that we just talked about a few moments ago. He laments that despite David's claims concerning man's dominion over all things, at the end of verse 8 he says, but now we do not yet see all things put under him. So the writer of, of Hebrews is taking David's psalm and he's saying, this is truth. What is man that you are mindful of him? What is the son of man that you visited him? You've made him a little over the angels. You've given him dominion over everything. There's nothing that's not subject to him. He's sub everything's subject to him. This is the created purpose. This is the order. This is what you designed it to be. But unfortunately, he has to be honest and say, we do not yet see all things put under him. That was Phillips's point in his commentary. Man does not presently have dominion over the earth and everything in it, despite his being created by God for that very purpose. And the reason is because of Adam's sin in the garden. Mankind has lost his dominion over creation. And now, speaking of the reality at the time that the writer of Hebrews was writing his letter, and the reality of the age in which we are living right now also, all things are not yet placed under man's subjection. But even those two little words, not yet, are extremely important. While things aren't right now as God intended them to be, this does not apparently have to mean that things will always remain as they presently are. The author of Hebrews goes on to state this, while we don't yet see all things under dominion of mankind, what does he say at the beginning of verse 9? We do see something. We see Jesus. <laughs> We see Jesus, he says. We see Jesus who himself, verse 9, was made a little lower than the angels. A statement that is obviously reminding his readers of the incarnation of Jesus Christ. Jesus, who the author of Hebrews has already informed us was very God. I know you know it, but just turn back a page. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1. God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become so much better than the angels, as he was by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. If you were doubting who this Jesus is, well, he is God who was willing to become man and to place himself a little lower than the angels, to take on the form of us who were made a little lower than the angels. And thus placing himself a little lower than the angel, he has made himself able to perform the incredible work of redemption. Thus, the writer of Hebrews goes on in verse 9, he says, But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, for the suffering of death. Why death? What in the world does death have to do with God? Whose life? What is going on here? We know why death, because the wages of sin is death. For sinful mankind to ever be redeemed, for sinful mankind to ever be regenerated, for sinful mankind to ever reclaim the position that God created for him in the beginning of the very image makers of God himself, then God's judgment upon man's sin was going to have to be met. Jesus left heaven and took on the form of man so that he could die, and in dying he could be made sin for us. Paul told the Corinthians, for he hath made him to be sin for us. Who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him? God's righteousness. God's image, if you will. That we might be made what God created us to be, but that was lost, forfeited by the foolishness of Adam in the garden. Jesus, through his death and becoming sin for us, has made possible that we could be reclaimed and we could know this righteousness once again. The writer of Hebrews reminds us that Jesus, by the grace of God, verse 9, might taste death for every man. You know, how beautiful is that? 
Regardless of where you or I stand today, regardless of whatever sin you or I may have ever committed in our lives, we can be assured that Jesus, by God's grace, has tasted death on our behalf. In other words, he has sufficiently paid our sin debt so that we, through him, can now experience life. In the middle of verse 9, but we see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death. Now, what, what's the, what's, what is with him now? Crowned with glory and honor. Crowns are placed upon the heads of rulers. And Jesus has been crowned with glory. And he has been crowned with honor. But what is the writer of Hebrews' purpose in bringing this information from our psalm into this particular epistle? It seems as if the author's point is to remind these individuals who have trusted in Christ, but we know in the book of Hebrews, they're being, they're being told by these Judaizers, oh, Jesus isn't enough. <laughs> you got to do all these other things if you really want to be acceptable to God. And apparently they were wavering. And the writer of Hebrews is writing this epistle to say, what are you talking about? Jesus is everything. He's all that you need. Get your focus on Jesus and Jesus alone. So he's telling these who have trusted in Christ exactly what it means to be in Jesus. No, the writer of Hebrews honestly does exclaim, we are not now, all things are not now placed under man's feet as God intended them. And as David recorded in the psalm, man was created to have them. And the reason for this is because mankind has forfeited his right to rule over creation because of his sin. So while we cannot see man ruling over creation as he should now, the writer of Hebrews says we can see Jesus. We can see the glorious creator who came to earth, taking upon himself human form, suffering and dying as the payment for our sins, and now having been crowned with glory and honor. And in seeing this victorious Jesus, we realize that the reality of this present world is not the way it will always be. It's not the way it will always be. That, that itself ought to change our way of thinking. Why are we so in love with this world? This is a fallen world, a cursed world. Why are we governed by it? Why do we love it? Why does it rule us? Why do we forfeit so many things that God has prepared for us that we might have more of this world that means absolutely nothing? What is wrong with us? We're just like Adam. We don't get it. We can't see it. God puts it in front of our eyes and we still are blind. Oh, Jesus, what's the big deal with Jesus? Why would I want to devote my life to Jesus? Don't you know if I follow Jesus, I can't have all these things and look at all these things. Aren't these wonderful things? God in heaven must be saying, are you nuts? You're letting the creation rule you. I created you to rule the creation. What is wrong? Everything's upside down. And folks, if it wasn't for Jesus, that's the way it would remain. There would be no hope of it ever being whatever Adam lost would be lost forever. But we see Jesus. <laughs> we see Jesus. Things aren't always going to be as they are now. We doubt this. We need to look no further than the testimony of Scripture concerning us. We're not going to read it. We wrote it this morning. Ephesians 1, 17-23. What was Paul praying to the Ephesian church? God, please open their eyes. Help them to see. God, they don't get it. Help them to see. Help them to understand who they are in Christ Jesus. Help them to know that they are his fullness and he's their fullness. Help them to see. The Bible talks about when Jesus comes back to rule and reign on the millennial kingdom. Who's coming with him? He's bringing his saints with him. We will rule and reign with him. I don't think we're just ruling over the humans on the world. I think we're going to rule the world. That's what he saved us to do. That's what he created us to be. 
We're going to come back and rule with him. This marks the beginning of the restoration of all things by God. And as David in his psalm, I don't know how much of the future he's thinking about in his psalm. I don't want to shortchange him. He may have had all kinds of insight into things that we don't know. But as he's just laying there one night, looking up at the stars and the moon, and imagining God's creation, he says, God, as amazing as this is, you're so much greater, but God, if you're so much greater than all this, why do you think about me? God, why have you visited me? Why have you put all things under my feet? Why is everything in your creation subject to me? Why is this? David wants to know. And you know what his conclusion is? As he ponders these thoughts, Oh Lord, our Lord, Oh Yahweh, Adonai, how wonderful is thy name in all the earth. I think David's just overwhelmed. He's taken aback by who his God is and that God's desires for him. Friends, how exalted is our God? How worthy of all praise and worship and honor and service is our God? And how almost unfathomable is the fact that this God, our God, is mindful of us. That he has visited us. And through Christ, he will one day restore to us the intended position of those who exercise dominion over the work of his hands. Friends, friends, get it, get it. Teresa, I don't want you to forget this sermon. You're always telling us how worthless we are. Today I'm telling you how amazing we are as God's people. Get it, friends. Get it. Don't forget it. Don't lose it. Don't be duped by Satan. Who's always out trying to sell us counterfeit stuff. Telling us how bad we have it as God's people. And how much better we could have it if we would just reject God and his ways. It's a lie out of the pit of hell. Don't fall for it. Understand who you are, what Christ has come to make you, and what your future is. I don't know what that means, but I know this. You and I are going to have dominion over all of God's creation. It's going to be subservient to us as God's redemptive people. What is man? Father, I pray you challenge us with these thoughts. May your spirit do what this feeble person could never do. Stir our hearts with the reality of this truth. May it forever transform us. May it make things different, real things different in our daily lives as we face temptations and testings and trials. May we go into them with our eyes open. Help us to see what's real. Should we not by faith see the unseen? Should we not by faith rest and order our steps based upon what you have declared is so? I don't care what it looks like around us. This is so. This is fact. Change us forever by your truth. And we might walk in the reality of our position as the redeemed. And that you, O Lord, our Lord, your name might be magnified and exalted in all the earth. Oh, Father, we love you. We praise you. We stand in awe of your gracious desires concerning us. And it's in the precious name of Jesus who makes it possible that we ask these things. Amen.